Okay, so this is chapter four, taxation of individuals, and we're going to break this up into two uh, lectures. And so let's get started here. First thing we want to look at is the individual income tax formula. And so we'll get into the details of this later. But um, it starts with gross income, and um, it talks about gross income being an all-inclusive income, um, income concept. Um, the Section 61 of the Internal Revenue Code defines income as all income from whatever source derived. So basically, it's pretty much any income you receive unless somehow it's um, excluded in the tax code or deferred somehow to, to um, some later uh, tax year. Um, you know, this is realized income, which realized income means that there was some sort of transaction between two parties, and so in that transaction, they exchanged property rights, and fair consideration was given for the things bargained for, if you will. Uh, from gross income, you deduct what are called four AGI deductions. We'll look at the Form 1040 to find out where those four AGI deductions are here in a minute. Uh, so gross income minus four AGI deductions equals adjusted gross income. And then from adjusted gross income, you deduct or uh, subtract uh, from AGI deductions. And those consist of two things, either the uh, greater of the standard deduction, and we'll look at those, or itemized deductions. We'll look at itemized deductions in Chapter 6, I believe. So you take the greater of those two, and then also uh, personal and dependency exemptions as well. And so those two things, either the greater of standard deduction or itemized deductions, and personal and dependency exemptions are subtracted from AGI in order to come up with taxable income. And then with taxable income, you take and look at the tax rates for that income. And, you know, again, it's depending on filing status and, you know, it's a graduated income tax, so not all income is taxed at the same level. And so you get your uh, income tax liability, and then there could be other taxes that you have to add to that, and so that equals total taxes. And from that, you subtract credits, uh, prepayments, which would be like your withholding and estimated tax, <coughs> tax payments if you're uh, self-employed. And so that will either equal tax due if you're underpaid or uh, refund if you overpaid uh, in comparison with the total tax due. Now, uh, the form that you use is uh, Form 1040, like you have in the book, Chapter 4, page 4-3, Exhibit 4-2. And so let's take a look at that. All right, so it starts out name, address, social security numbers, um, filing status. Uh, if you have, uh, you have your exemptions here, you have taxpayers exemption, if married filing jointly, so uh, there's a spouse, uh, and then you have a couple of dependents. And then, so you add those up for total exemptions of four. Uh, each exemption gets a, a, a deduction 
from taxable income of $4,050 each. So here, um, looking at the income section, which is line seven through 22, you see that uh, we've got wages, taxable interest, notice here tax exempt interest you have to include there, you have to report it even though it's not included in uh, taxable income. Uh, qualified dividends we'll talk about a little bit, uh, alimony received, that's pretty interesting, capital gains and losses, business income, uh, Schedule C is attached if you're self-employed, IRA distributions, pensions and annuities, farm income, unemployment compensation, social security benefits, and so you take any income that applies here, uh, here you just have two, and you add those up, here you have 130,600, and then down here you have your four AGI deductions, and most of them are business or employment related, A couple of exceptions, uh, notice alimony pay doesn't have anything to do with employment or uh, self-employment or, or your job, but yet it's listed as a 4 AGI deduction. And so you, you add up all these 4 AGI deductions if applicable and you subtract that number from line 22 your total income and put that in uh, line 37 as your adjusted gross income. Okay, so let's go back and talk about some more things here. All right, so um, two concepts, uh, realized income, and recognized income. If you realize income from a transaction, you have to recognize it on your tax return unless the Internal Revenue Code says that that realized income is either uh, exempt from reporting, such as um, tax-free municipal bonds, or it's deferred, such as um, in installment sales. So you must recognize it unless it's excluded or deferred. You also have to consider the character of uh, income or loss its character determines how it's taxed, whether or not it's taxed, and if so, at what rate, if it's taxed. Of course, tax exempt, no tax, tax deferred is uh, taxed in whatever year the tax code says it's to be taxed in. Again, if you have a uh, um, situation where you're, you do an installment sale and you're to receive payments over five years, well, you, you recognize those install, installment payments in the years you receive them. Most individuals receive through either self-employment or uh, employment with another ordinary income. And so if it's uh, an ordinary income item, such as a salary, then it's taxed at ordinary rates from the tax rate schedule. Two other types of character are qualified dividends, which are taxed at preferential rates. Um, the dividends are taxed at either zero, 15% or 20% depending on the taxpayer's income level for um, taxpayers in the 15 or below bracket 
uh, their tax on qualified dividends at zero percent if uh, the taxpayers in the mid-range uh, tax rates then they're taxed on dividends at 15 percent and higher income individuals are taxed on dividends at 20 percent same thing goes for capital gains or loss now it kind of depends on well it, actually, it depends on whether or not it's short, considered short-term or long-term. So, uh, again, not all capital gains or losses are, especially capital gains, are not all uh, taxed at um, preferential rates. And so we'll look at that here. So, first of all, what is a capital gain or loss? Well, it's derived from the sale of a capital asset. Well, what's a capital asset? Well, it's, a, it, it's essentially any asset that uh, is not used in a business, such as um, accounts receivable from the sale of goods or services, inventory held for sale in the ordinary course of business, um, and assets used in a trader business. So anything else is considered a capital asset. Now, uh, for instance, your your personal use car is a capital asset. Your home is a capital asset. Pretty much all your personal property uh, that you have are uh, capital assets. Uh, if you have investments in say stock, mutual funds, things of that sort, those are capital assets. So if you own capital assets and you sell them, you have to determine whether or not it's considered a long-term capital gain or loss or a short-term capital gain or loss. Whether something short-term or long-term depends on how long they held it. If you held it for the, the capital asset for more than a year, it's considered a long-term capital gain or loss. If you hold it for less or a year, one year or less, then it's considered a short-term capital gain or loss. Net, what they call net long-term capital gains are taxed at preferential rates. Uh, net short-term capital losses and net short-term capital gains, or excuse me, net short-term, uh, net long-term capital losses. So let me repeat that. <laughs> Net long-term capital gains are taxed at preferential rates, mostly 15%, just like dividends. Net short-term capital losses and net long-term capital losses, what you do with those is you can deduct $3,000 in the year of the loss, and you get to deduct that as a four AGI expense from AGI, so it's a dollar for dollar redu reduction in AGI. Well, what happens if you have uh, more than a uh, $3,000 net capital loss, either long-term or short-term in a year? Well, you get to carry it over to succeeding years and get to use three thousand uh, dollars to count uh, against AGI in those succeeding years, and you get to do that. You get to carry it forward for an indefinite period of time until it's all used up. Now, what happens if you have a net short-term capital gain? Well, net short-term capital gain is taxed at ordinary rates, so that's not a preferential rate, obviously. And again, most taxpayers, if they have net long-term capital gain, are taxed at 15%, but again, like dividends, it depends on what your uh, marginal tax rate is. All right, so those deductions for AGI are considered deductions above the line because they're, they're determined, 
what they do is they reduce income dollar for dollar in determining adjusted gross income. Deductions from AGI are considered deductions below the line, and so they're deducted from adjusted gross income to determine taxable income. Again, you take the greater of the standard deduction or, or itemized deductions as well as any personal uh, and dependency exemptions. But the question I ask here is why might a from AGI deduction not reduce taxable income? Well, the answer is if you have itemized deductions, but your total of itemized deductions is less than the standard deduction, then you, you have a situation where a from AGI deduction does not reduce taxable income. All right, as far as the standard deduction, that amount for 2017, and it changes every year, depends on your filing status. In, 12, uh, in 2017, it's 12,700 for married filing jointly, uh, 2,700 for uh, what's called a qualifying widow or widower, also called a surviving spouse. Uh, married filing separately is exactly half at 6350 uh, Head of household is somewhere in the middle between MFJ and uh, single and married filing separately at 9350 and single is the same as married filing separately for 6350 uh, There are some additional deductions for amounts for age over 65 and eyesight. If you're legally blind, that we'll talk about <laughs> legally blind, legally blind, that we'll talk about in uh, chapter six. Now remember, we use the progressive tax rate schedule, so not all income is is uh, taxed at the same rate. It's progressive. So, you know, the earlier dollars are, are taxed at a lower rate than later dollars. And again, when some things are taxed at preferential rates, so you, you have to segregate those things from your ordinary income when determining taxes, and you have to consider those uh, separately when you're calculating total tax due. You might have other taxes, uh, alternative minimum tax, self-employment tax, of course, if you're self-employed, you have to add back in. And uh, if you're a high wage earner, you might have uh, these last one of these last two. Tax credits reduce tax liability dollar for dollar. Some tax credits are like the child, child credit, uh, child care credit. Uh, I think there's some education-related uh, tax credits as well that we'll talk about later. Uh, and then tax prepayments are either through uh, estimated tax payments you might make if you're self-employed or if, um, if you're employed by someone else, they are required to withhold taxes from your paycheck. All right, um, let's briefly talk about the personal exemptions and dependency exemptions, and then I'll start uh, the second part of this lecture in part two. But anyway, uh, taxpayer gets a personal exemption of $4,050 in 2017. If they are married filing jointly, the spouse gets an exemption of $4,050, so total of uh, $8,100. Uh, any dependent that they can claim as a dependent, they get a dependency exemption for those people as well, $4,050 per dependent. Okay? All right, so we'll talk about <clears throat> here in a minute what is a dependent. So let me stop there, and we will uh, finish 
of this chapter and part two.